Let's go, baby. Welcome to the Athletes and Asses podcast. I'm your host, Noah Lack, and I bring on elite athletes to chat about a business topic, whether it's venture capital, retail, sales, crypto. Your favorite athletes know a lot more about business than you think, but how would you know that from just watching mainstream media? You're going to learn a topic of business here, but you're also going to learn a lot about the athletes themselves. Tune in. Please like, subscribe, give us a follow, because we're bringing the heat. Let's get it. Let's go, baby. This is another episode of the Athletes and Assets podcast, and today I'm joined by a former professional tennis player who has been one of the most pivotal creative directors in Apple's history, has been has had a chance to work with the likes of Steve Jobs, um, early you know creator of the name of the iPod, helped design the Apple Store, uh, the Genius Bar, has made various films promoting iOS. I mean, this guy should have been in the Steve Jobs documentary uh, if he wasn't so already. I'm joined by Rick Vargas. Rick, let's skip the small talk, man. What is more nerve-wracking for you, uh, a professional tennis match or presenting something to Steve Jobs? Uh Oh, that's, that's actually, <laughs> Steve was really intense. I, I think still a tennis match was pretty stressful. I mean, I think that when you play for money, I think that's a whole nother thing. And so it's, a, it's another amount of pressure that I think goes beyond um, business for me anyway. So that would be my answer. <laughs> so you're taking, you're taking a tennis match. I think that, yeah. And in terms of, playing for money it is very very hard you know extremely yeah hard. you take me back when your career was over you're sitting on top of a hill in greece and you're thinking yeah. about art and design what was it about this space that made you feel like after you were done uh off the court like this is what you wanted to pursue yeah i didn't again i played you know on and off for a couple of years um you know, Mexico and in Europe and I ended up in Greece and there, you know, I was injured. I had uh, this ankle injury that kept flaring up and, you know, and I knew I was like, God, I don't know if I could keep going. I was, I think the next term was in um, Italy or something. And I was like, God, I, I, I think I'm kind of ready to, you know, I wanted, I wanted a house. I wanted basic stuff <laughs> and the level I was at, I was just basically making enough money to go to the next tournament. So I was ready and I was sitting on this hill and I remember thinking, okay, so what, what else do I love to do besides playing tennis? And the other thing was art and I wanted to go into commercial art. So I just said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to put the energy that I put into tennis, which was a lot, you know, four to five hours a day, every day. And I just said, I'm going to put all that into, to, to commercial design and, and see how far I can go. So that's what I did. I came back. Um, I got a degree from uh, Cal State Fullerton. And then I went on and took courses at Art Center in Pasadena um, to kind of round out the weaknesses that I felt I needed and then just dove into it. Whenever I talk to an athlete of an individual sport, they always say, it's always, it's eat what you kill. You know, if you, if you don't, <laughs> If you don't win the uh, the tournaments, um, that your flight home will be coming out of your own pocket, um, and there's a different level of pressure that you have in those individual sports: track, fighting, tennis, you name it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand that, or they see it they see it being played, and they don't understand what's actually going on. The the mental jousting and you know, I, I didn't think I was a really super competitive person. I mean, I'm competitive. My wife thinks I'm crazy competitive. But compared to the people <laughs> that I played against, I mean, I, I don't know if I had the same kind of um, des winning desire. So I would have to psych myself. I'd have to come up with something that I hated about the person <laughs> that I wanted to take them down. Like I, And that's what it felt like. It felt like I was strangling somebody almost you know, until they were tapped out. That's... And um, it's a weird kind of thing, but whatever you have to do to get yourself there, you know, into this mindset, um, 
and uh, business world to me just seemed like child's play. Like I, like I told you, it just didn't, I, I, didn't feel like anything. I tend to agree in many ways. I tend to agree in many ways because I felt so much stress, pain, anxiety, excitement, adrenaline from basketball that even being in a high stress environment in the corporate finance world, or you know, now I'm in startup life, like it, it's it's stressful, but it's not as stressful like when you're in a stadium with a sold out crowd. Um, I, I just it just doesn't feel the same, for better or for worse. Um, yeah. But Rick, I, I fascinated to hear about your your contributions, your role at Apple. Um, obviously, you were big into creative design, and you did a couple of, of, of different things, which I want to touch on. But can we – do you remember the first time you met Steve Jobs? Yeah, I, I, I'm i trying to remember. We, I, we had to meet with him um, every couple weeks, and I think um, Hiroki brought me in one time, and I think it was just Hiroki and myself and introduced me. I mean, I knew who he was, but you got to remember in 2000 – Apple was still getting its footing. You know what I mean? It had almost gone out of business in 1997 when Steve right. came back. And then so he was bringing it back. So it's not the same kind of – I think it was a little more humbling for him maybe. And Interesting. I didn't see it like, oh, you know, this guy that built this massive thing. I just thought, you know, oh, maybe I can help out. And, um it happened pretty quickly and he would just say, you know, morning gentlemen or whatever. And then he'd get right into it. It was never, there was never small talk. There was never getting to know you. It was never yeah. anything like that. It was always very straight to the point. What are you working on? Let me see it. Let me, you know, let me weigh in. Um, and it was pretty serious. He took everything really seriously. So it was always a lot of pressure in there. Um, and it was also a timing thing. You know, we were trying to launch the, the retail stores um, as well as products. And um, it just never seemed like there was enough time. I mean, I pretty much, even though I lived in San Francisco and I would drive to Cupertino, um, I stayed at the Cupertino Inn, I would say, three or four days a week because wow. there was no time for me to even get back. Like, we worked round the clock. 10 to 12 hours a day, maybe more sometimes. I mean, it, was, it was nuts in the beginning. That's, that's incredible that that's incredible that Steve and sort of the leadership at Apple cultivated that environment where folks were motivated to, to work that hard around the clock. I don't know whether it was out of fear or whether I was passion for designing the product. Um, it seems like fear. he ran it. <laughs> it was fear. He's a pretty tough guy, yeah. I mean, it was... Yeah, it was more like fear a little bit. And and I think I I really enjoyed doing design. You know, I really love it. So it was easy for me to like fall into that, you know, and and to go with it. And I and I wasn't you know, I didn't have I wasn't married then, so I so it was like, okay, I'm I'm going to just this I'm I'm going to do great at this. I'm going to just work as hard as I possibly can and um so we were all there, you know, there was, and it wasn't just me, you know, there was a lot of people there that, you know, that contributed, obviously, you know, it's not one person, it's a team of people. And, um, Ron Johnson, who was, who was head of retail, I worked with very closely, uh, on helping, you know, build the store out. And he was quite different than Steve. He was, I respected him, his thinking and his management style was totally different. It was more love the people that you work with inspire those people and you know let them do what they need to do uh and steve <laughs> steve had a completely different mindset so um i did get to work underneath a few you know different styles of management yeah absolutely and, and one thing that i mean apple has of course a signature brand i think when people mm -hmm. think of brand there's not sort of a conclusive way of, of constructing like what brand value means or what, what the brand is. During that time, you know, how did you leverage your, you know, your, your desire for, for design and art, like your, your ability like to help create sort of has, which, which, which has been one of the best brands in human history? Uh, especially in the commercial and yeah. commercial sense, I, I would argue that yeah, it is, it's one of the best brands on the planet. And I, I think that I 
learned a great deal when I went to Apple. You know, I was doing advertising at a pretty high level, but in advertising, uh, how, how do I say it? It's more like um, you're trying to be really clever and you get awarded for being very creative in advertising. And, um, you know, you're winning these awards. And that back then, that was the way that agencies grew. They win, they win these awards and they, you know, would attract more companies. At Apple, I mean, I got schooled at the beginning. I mean, there's no question about it. I came in with this idea, oh, you know, it's the clever, creative thing. And Steve sure. quickly was about, it's about being clear, not creative. <laughs> it's about you know, explaining the, to the consumer in the most minimal way, um, you know, the benefits of this product. Hmm. And, you know, that was very, that was a different way of thinking than I had been used to in advertising. Um, and that's why he had a different way of marketing, you know, just this, this idea of simplicity, this idea of reductive qualities, everything, you know, reducing everything down. So that, you know, I transitioned from doing things, you know, in the advertising world to doing things the way Apple does things. And I quickly got on board and I, and I think it helped me grow, you know, as a, as a marketing person. Um, and that's really, that's really Steve, Steve infused the whole company like that. So everybody, the DNA of Apple is still like that. You know, when you look at stuff, it, it still has that very simple, clear, messaging no no doubt the the simple the simple minimalist brand that we've we've come to use today whether it's the iphone or apple tv or the, of course the laptops i mean it's everywhere but if we go back you had a huge hand in the ipod and came up with the part pod part of the ipod can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that story and yeah, also that's an interesting story <laughs> it, 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 it i also want to hear throughout the story like the feedback process because i don't know if you did unless unless i'm wrong you might have gotten yeah. it right the first time yeah 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 so well that was one of my first assignments and it was codenamed jupiter i remember that and um and basically, Steve described this thing on a whiteboard, you know, here's the computer and here's things that are going to be attached to the computer. One of those things being this MP3 player that you guys need to name or, you know, work on the naming. So we, uh, my partner, Vinny Chieco, actually had this idea, you know, he was like, well, the computer is a lot like, that laptop is a, is a lot like the mothership um, on 2001 Space Odyssey. And I was like, well, that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, so, you know, we watch the film and in that film, you know, there's this moment where Hal talks about, you know, the pod, open the pod, pay doors. And so the name came, it came from that. And a lot of people don't know that. And um, anyway, that was just one of many ideas. You know, we had a stack of names. Um, and when we presented those to Steve, I remember him not choosing that name, pod, and Vinny, to his credit, pulled it right out of the no pile and said, you may want to consider this one again. And I remember he picks it up and he just goes, fine. And he throws it in the maybe. <laughs> and, then, and then later on, you know, it kept getting some traction. I think Lee Clow and Johnny both like the name pod and Johnny Ives, who was the designer at Apple. And we heard, you know, that, oh, it's still in the running. And and then the next thing I knew, I just saw it on an outdoor board driving down the freeway. You know, so it was, it was one of those kind of things. It was just, I wasn't privy to some of that stuff. But um, yeah, I did get a chance to work on it. And Steve Steve, uh, Steve didn't like pod? What did he want? iJams? Like, what well, was he pod, thinking? We, didn't, we couldn't secure the rights to pod because there were, there were countries that had trademarked the name pod. And he wanted to trademark it around the world. So he added the i. Um, the little acronym that he added on iMac for internet, he just dragged it over onto pod. Um, and then we knew, he knew no one else could own that. And that basically allowed him to, you know, trademark it around the world, get rights to it. Um, there were a lot of things like that. I mean, his, his genius is, uh, you know, and I, there was, a, there are a lot of stories about, you know, I'd listen and I'd go, wow, that was incredibly smart. It, all, it always seemed like common sense, like, why didn't I think of that? You know, or I should have thought of that or, you know, that happened a lot where we were like, you know, we do a lot of work and then he'd be like, why isn't this like this? And we'd be like, yeah, we need to, we need, so he kept you on your toes constantly 
with stuff like that. Um, you know, and I, I would also say that Hiroki is pretty pivotal as well. Hiroki, okay. I don't know if he gets credit for this, but you know, he, his idea, and I believe it was his idea to bring basically everything in house. When you look at companies, there are a lot of companies around the world that don't have good brands. And, and part of the problem is, is because they're constantly using advertising agencies, design firms, and all of those different agencies have a different way of doing things. So, you know, everything gets fragmented a little bit. And Hiroki's idea was let's bring everything in house, you know, packaging, uh, you know, direct mail, online, website, you know, everything. And we'll bring everything in house. And that way, when we come up with an idea, we're going to send it out into the world and it'll always be like this, the way we're, we want it. Um, that kind of super, super tight laser focused control. That was his idea. And it, it took years to do that, to consolidate. Mm. Um, but eventually, I think it helped Apple, again, become one of the best brands in the world. Uh, with all that stuff you went through, like in that whole process with the iPod, I can only imagine that pr your process with the Apple Store and designing the Apple Store. Can you speak a little bit about like sort of the, the well, feedback loops there? Yeah, yeah. There, we went obviously back and forth with a lot of things there, that I do remember um, – you know, the store has these very long panels and um, you know, it, was, it was architecturally designed that way. So we'd have to solve for those panels. And I know originally um, Steve liked the idea of having a lot of information on those panels. Um, but we started noticing when we went in the store that people wouldn't even look at those panels. They would just... They just go in and they would look for the products and they would kind of go through the products, you know, and, and we kept thinking about that and thinking, you know, it doesn't really make sense for, ha for us to have a ton of information on these panels. They really should be more um, sort of location specific. So, you know, maybe there's just a shot of an iMac or maybe there's a shot of an iPod over there and accessories or whatever so that you can at least kind of go, oh, I know where these things are. So not, not a lot of information on there. He, Steve originally saw those as brochures, kind of. And mm. so he was convinced of that, and we were convinced of the other thing. We were like, no, that's not how, it's not how people um, look at things when they, when they come in. We really noticed that. And so then we started doing research, and we kept trying to convince him. And I'll tell you, that guy is could be very stubborn. I mean, he just did not want to budge on that. Like, and we kept telling him, well, are you sure? You know, let's we'll look at this. We could do it this way. And he, and I remember, I think it was the second year. I think we worked on it for two years. And then we did a study with a focus group that went in and we interviewed people in the store, which is something we never do. Usually at Apple, we would just trust our gut. And, um, and eventually the, the numbers came back. We're like, absolutely no one looks at those things or they only look at those things for directional purposes. And we said, I remember that meeting and we said, Steve, we want to show you these things, yada, yada, yada. And we, we had all the information, all the quantitative information. And he's like, fine. <laughs> and he was just like, he kind of tossed it away. Like, okay. Like he didn't say you guys won, but he was like, okay, I believe you, you know, and it took, literally two years for him to actually believe us on that, you know? So, Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's not an easy guy to convince. I mean, and you really had to, you really had to prove your point. Um, so you really had, you had to be firm. You had to stand on what you were creating. You couldn't come to Steve like one foot in one foot out. You'd probably get ripped to shreds. Yeah. You had, yeah, you defended the work and, and there were some times when he did just immediately gravitate towards a few things. Um, and occasionally he might, you know, I, I remember the one time where he did grab something off the wall and he, he really looked at it and I was like, oh God, is he going to trash this thing or what? But he, he ran out of the room and, and I was like, oh, and I remember Hiroki telling me, oh, that's a great meeting. You know, he loves that idea. And I was like, okay, great. I mean, you know, he's not a guy that yeah. threw around compliments, but you, um, even that made you, made me feel pretty good. I was like, Oh, he liked that. That's wonderful. You know, or 
No, for sure. Rick, Rick, what do you think was your most proud design at Apple? I think that maybe there were two things. I mean, I think that I think I did help the store. I think initially, you know, figuring out a lot of those things, figuring out what they should look like. But I think the value films that I did later on, I think people remember um, there, there was a lot of films that we did for um, sustainability. We, I remember doing a, a film for for uh, sustainability. One of the first ones are solar panels we were using in North Carolina and uh, worked on a film. And I remember Tim Cook coming into our edit bay, which is highly unusual. And, um, you know, sitting down and I could see that he really cared about how we were perceived and, and what we actually did. Um, and I think that's very different than Steve. I think that Tim really cared mm. about the planet really cared about his legacy and that and that apple we were doing something for the planet and so i'm proud of those films and i'm proud of um you know communicating some of those ideas because i think we were one of the first companies to do it and then then a lot of companies started doing it started talking about their values um you know i think that we realized that people, you know, use their wallets when they think about those values in companies, you know, and I don't think companies before then thought about that. Uh, Rick, what's uh, Steve Jobs versus Tim Cook side by side comparison? How do you how would you compare the two? <laughs> I, I think Steve was really, you know, he was, he cared a lot about marketing, he cared a lot about the music, he cared a lot about everything that went into our films, went into our store, went into anything that we sent out. I mean, he had an, he had a very high level of interest in all of the stuff that we were doing and he got into the granular level. I mean, I remember him, you know, arguing with me about kerning, you know, people don't even know what kerning is, but it's a distance between letters. And he would like, you know, I think those things should be closer <laughs> together. And I was like, man, like, um, most people don't understand typography at that level. You know what I mean? And so, I would question myself, do I have that right? You know, do I mm. let me look at that again? Or let me look at that line again. I remember I, I had written a line once that had something like, um, I don't exactly remember the, the line, but it was John something. I had just John in there. And he's like, why John? And I said, well, John is a common name. It, it, you know, a lot of people could relate to John. And he's like, why not Axel? <laughs> I remember him specifically saying that. And I was just like, oh, wow, that takes it in a whole different, you know, uh, place. And he really pushed me to think about every single thing. And that's the gift of Steve, that he, he was maniacal with the details. I think Tim, like I said before, really cared about the values of the company. And, um, and, I, and I think that was his strength, you know, and he still is, you know, very proud of that. Um, if you look at the latest launch film, there's a there's a whole film about those values in there, and um, I think that'll be his legacy. Is um, you know he gave back. He he really did try to protect the planet, and um, and he's a, and and I think Apple has been a leader because of him to a lot of companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that that's pretty awesome, then, and it's incredible uh, that you've had the chance to to work. Hand in hand with 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 two legends and and giants, and be able to show off the designs and, and the contributions to Apple are uh, you know well noted. So we appreciate you chatting about that, Rick. Quarters a little bit switching gears here. Uh, what do you think? For what advice do you have for athletes that are looking to get more involved in design and and make design and creative designing a career? I think. Just taking the energy they put into, I mean, if that's what you want to do, you, you, want, you, you have to want and love being a creative, love thinking of ideas. I do. I mean, I, I would do it if no one paid me <laughs> anyway. So that's how, that's how much I love doing it. And I think if there's an athlete who wants to do that, just, just pour yourself into it like the way you did into your sports, you know, into your uh, professional athletic career. If you do that, I mean, you could become a brain surgeon. I mean, so many of these athletes that I know that, that, that I played with and people that I, you know, that are at the top of their games, they spend, they have spent their whole life doing this. I mean, you know, countless hours 
if you put three quarters of that energy into something, you will become an expert at it. There is no question mm. in my mind they'll be successful. And everybody wants to work with somebody who's really good at something. So um, that's what that's what I would suggest doing. Between going back to school after an athlete's done playing, getting a job in design and designing your own stuff and marketing it and building out a portfolio, what is sort of the the route you would prefer or advise athletes to take or a combination of the three? I think what's really important is that you find somebody that you who's really good at, at design and creative direction and have them look at your work because you need to be critiqued by somebody who's in the business, who understands it really well. I mean, otherwise you can flounder and you can, you, you might have some things that are working pretty well, but the idea behind them is probably the most important thing. And being able to generate ideas that meet the marketing brief that you're given is really what you're getting paid to do. Um, and it needs to be at a high level. Um, it's a competitive business, like any business, it's super competitive. So, um, but I would suggest finding somebody in the field that you can share your work with um, and guide you a little bit. It's super helpful. It's kind of an apprenticeship kind of thing. I feel like I learned mm, through, being an apprentice. Learned through other people and I watched them and, and I learned, you know, a lot from those people. Do you give tests to people who want to talk to you and say, hey, critique me on my design. Is there a baseline level of craftsmanship that you can evaluate and be like, okay, I see you having a career as a, as a designer, or, or you say, okay, don't quit your day job? Well, I believe everybody has the ability to get better, so it's hard for me. I would never say, I mean, I think there are some people that have an aptitude for it that have a skill of you know really being detailed and looking at things and having some fresh ideas but it's like you know it's a muscle thing you just the more you do it the better you get maybe they they're not willing to put that many hours into it so they may not get to that level but i think if you work at something hard enough i mean you're a good you, you played baseball right there're probably some guys in your team close basketball or basketball right sorry basketball all good. I'm sorry. There's some, I'm sure there's some guys in your team that may not have been the most talented people, but they worked so hard <laughs> that they got to this level. And that's an example of that, right? So, you know, there are a lot of people, not the most talented, but incredibly hardworking and rise to the challenge. So I think it's the same thing in design in advertising and any of these kind of creative fields that if you work really, really hard at it, you can get there. It's really, it, there's no secret way to get there quickly. I'll tell you that. I mean, you really have to put in the time just like anybody else. So, you know, sure. Absolutely. Well, we, we, the a and community is appreciative of, uh, some design flavor, you know, entering the channel. So, uh, we're going to need it. And, uh, it, it, but we really appreciate you coming on Rick and sharing a bit of your story and your journey from tennis to working at the early days of Apple. And so, uh, this has been an incredible episode, uh, with Rick Vargas, uh, thank you, former creative at Apple. Um, Rick, thank you so much for joining the podcast. And, uh, thank you. Know,